Good afternoon from the Smith School of Business. My name is Meredith Dalt, and I am the moderator for today's session, Bringing Indigenous Business into the Supply Chain. I'll be joined shortly by John Paul Gladue, the President and CEO of the Canadian Council of Aboriginal Business APA Solutions, but I want to begin by covering some of the housekeeping stuff and answering any of your early questions. Firstly, today's session will be recorded. You'll be receiving that recording in two to three business days, and we invite you to share it with any friends or colleagues who can't be with us today. Next, we also encourage you to share our Smith Business Insight webinar invitations within your network. We have a very simple sign-up form. It's available at http ssbca slash webinars. You'll see it on your screen. After you sign up, you'll receive our invitations to webinars, which cover a variety of business topics, and they are always free to attend. If you have any questions while you're listening to today's webinar, please go ahead and ask those questions at any time. There's no need to wait till the end of the, of the webinar. I'll invite you to use the Q&A or chat panel located in the lower right-hand side of your screen to type in your question. Our presenter will answer questions at the end of today's session. As far as technical difficulties go, the most common is the issue of audio dropping out. Please understand that if your audio does drop out, it's usually only a momentary problem. If you wait a few seconds, it usually comes back on on, uh, on its own. If not, please use your chat window to, con to contact me. I'm your host. We will be able to provide you with a phone number you can use to call in, which is usually a more stable platform. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce today's session leader, J.P. Guadu. J.P., as I mentioned, is the President and CEO of the Canadian Council for Aboriginal Business, which is based in Toronto. Anishinaabe from Thunder Bay, JP is a member of Bingui Nayashi Anishinaabek, located on the eastern shores of Lake Nipigon, Ontario. JP completed a forestry technician diploma in 1993, obtained an undergraduate degree in forestry from Northern Arizona University in 2000, holds an executive MBA from Smith School of Business at Queen's University, and the ICD.D uh, from Rotman School of Management at University of Toronto. JP has more than two decades of experience in the natural resource sector. His career path includes work with Aboriginal communities and organizations, environmental uh, NGO organizations, industry, and governments from, from across Canada. Currently, JP serves on the board of the Ontario Power Generation and Naurant Resources, as well as the Canadian Electricity Association Public Advisory Panel. He has most recently been appointed as the Chancellor of St. Paul's University uh, St. Paul's University College, Waterloo. And with for, without further ado, I will pass it over to JP. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Meredith. So we'll get the slides off here. There we go. All right. Well, welcome everybody, and thank you for taking time out of your busy work week. It's uh, it is Friday, so we're we're nearing the end, which is. Uh, for for me, I'm I'm always kind of get sad on a Friday because I because I'm pretty driven and I'm I'm looking forward to my to getting back to the work that we do at the CCAB uh, on Monday. But um, before I get started, uh, I do want to recognize that, and I actually I apologize, I haven't done my homework, but I believe that we're on the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, the the Bay's Quinte, and I also and the, the Anishinaabe Bay as well. And why we why it's important uh, to recognize the territories, understanding that there is and have been a people in these these areas, wherever you are in the country, uh, for thousands of years and recognizing that uh, that connection to land and that we're uh, from a from a traditional teaching where we're, we're borrowing the land from our children. So uh, without further ado, I want to basically I want to walk you through uh, a little bit about the organization, a touch about myself, and then I want to kind of get into the idea of economic reconciliation. And from CCAB's perspective, economic reconciliation, when we look at the, the end game, it's really our communities that are, are managing wealth and not managing the poverty that we have been managing for, for quite some time. And the only way that we're going to manage wealth is by generating wealth. And to, in order to generate wealth, you need to leverage your assets, which are your people, uh, your land, and, and your innovation. And uh, the, the point uh, that I'm trying to make here is that at the end of the day, uh, when we've got a stronger Indigenous economy, uh, the bottom line for Canada starts to improve drastically. And you're going to see some of this as we walk through some of the slides. 
So a little bit about the CCAB. We were created over 35 years ago by a gentleman named Murray Koffler. Most of you probably recognize that name, the founder of Shoppers Drug, uh, Drug Mart. Uh, he called up his friends, Edward Bronfman and Paul Martin and a number of others with the idea of advancing the Indigenous uh, community through business. I like to remind Canadians, you know, Canada's first economic engine was really uh, us powering it, and it was that fur trade. Uh, and that's actually only a few hundred years ago, uh, less than that, actually. And that economy uh, was built on hard work. It was built on entrepreneurs. It was built on trade systems. It was built on commerce. Essentially, that powered a global, uh, a global economy. So we're getting back to that. And I'm, what, I, what I hope you're going to see throughout this presentation is that we're coming back with vigor. Um, our organization has been around, and we are a nonprofit, charitable organization. We've, we're a membership-based organization, and really our mission is about building those business relationships to create that space between the Indigenous and non-Indigenous communities to advance business interests. And we've got a number of programs. Uh, I'll talk about a few of them uh, that we have here at CCAB. So, oh, one second. So the next slide here, this... It's important for you to know who I am. I'm sitting here in, in the city. I, I live in Toronto, but I, it's always great to be back here at Queen's. Um, so I, I, I embrace the, uh, <laughs> the suits in the big cities, but I, I'm also very connected to land. And the reason why I show these images is because I'm, I'm very connected. It does actually resonate with a lot of Indigenous people because of our connection to land. And much of the challenges in this country are focused around land. Um, maybe I'm hoping we'll spend a little bit of time talking about maybe the TMX um, in the question period about uh, there's an article I believe that was sent out about indigenous ownership uh, uh, pipelines and infrastructure etc and uh, so I just wanted you to see a little bit about uh, about who I am so you can understand where I where I come from when I make some of the statements and I hope that I make you a little bit uncomfortable if we're feeling comfortable we're not growing so uh, I do hope to uh, to shift some of your thinking today so this is what happens in my community when we run out of fry bread. Okay, not really, but uh, you probably recognize this as Canada's national sport, which is lacrosse, and it is an indigenous sport. Um, Canada's other unofficial sport, uh, many of you probably are aware, but never really connected the dots, and that is uh, ping pong. And, and the reason why this is Canada's unofficial sport, so on one side of the table, you, you've got the federal department. And on the other side, you've got the provincial and territorial governments. And so you can imagine who that little white ball is in the middle. It's the indigenous community. So you gotta understand as an indigenous person or indigenous people, we are the fiduciary responsibility, the stewards, if you will, of the federal government. So when we go to the federal government to say, hey, listen, we wanna do something in our traditional territories. And um, the government says, well, that's all fine and dandy, but there is these things called the land transfer agreements. So you know what, you gotta go talk to the provinces or the territories. So across the table we go. And by the time we get over there, the province has already got their paddle ready to whack us back because they say, well, we can't help you because you're the responsibility of the federal government. And this game has been going on for quite some time. And the unintended consequences of this is that this has created a, a lot of uncertainty in the country. And uncertainty because we can't seem to find uh, the common ground these days when it comes to the relationships between the indigenous communities and governments. We recognize ourselves as governments and it's, it, we recognize that it should be a government to government relationship. And, and this, this game of ping pong has done nothing to add uh, to the prosperity of our country. But what we find is that a lot of the uh, companies, the resource sector based communities, uh, quite frankly, they've been in it longer than any other sector are understanding that you know we need to find a stronger path forward to work with indigenous businesses and communities because our projects uh, depend on it and you know we've taken as communities um, governments and industry to courts for years and we win over 90 percent of the court cases that we go into uh, there's over 250 court cases i believe to date that have fallen in the favor of indigenous communities so if you're a corporation thinking about taking an indigenous community or business to or a community sorry to court there's a strong chance that you're going to lose never mind the opportunity cost of of the money that you're spending in the project and um, all that investment and, and then when things become uncertain money becomes sparse it becomes more expensive so corporate Canada has been making a turn and there are a lot of 
great actors out there that are doing great work with our communities, and we'll, we'll, I'll share some of them with you uh, as we go throughout the day. But the challenge is that everybody on the phone, I hope, uh, understands that there's just been this significant movement in this country, a significant uh, work done by Murray Sinclair uh, on the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And, and it is really fantastic that there's these 94 calls to action. I, I really highly recommend that folks take a, take a read of the top lines of all those actions and find something that resonates with you. But the point I want to make here from, a, from reconciling differences is that it's not only about reconciling the difference between Indigenous people and industry or Indigenous people and government. It's also reconciling the differences that we have as people ourselves. In that, you know, we've got an on-reserve population and an off-reserve uh, population. That is about 50-50 these days. Uh, we've got a really strong demographic in our youth that are empowered, becoming more educated. And then we've got our older uh, population, our, our elders, our traditional holders, knowledge holders. Um, we've got hereditary chiefs. We've got elected chiefs. Um, we've got communities that are very much uh, pro-development, communities that don't want to see development, and everything else in between. So the conversation, so please take to heart that the conversation that's happening in our communities is not homogenous. There are differences in our communities from within and neighboring communities right across the country. So understanding that um, the way that you treat an Indigenous community is not a one-size-fits-all. And, and, and if you fall into that category, it's going to be a bumpy ride. So understanding that reconciling the differences also has to occur. <laughs> excuse me, uh, within our communities, in addition to everything that we're trying to do as far as building relationships with the rest of Canada. So what's really fascinating is I love when I'm traveling and then I'm sitting beside somebody on a plane and and then we get talking and they go, oh, well, the Indigenous, I didn't know there was Indigenous businesses. And I go, well, actually, there's 43,000 of us across the country, sec you know, coast to coast to coast, for, you know, competing in pretty much every sector. And by the way, our people contribute about $32 billion to Canada's economy. And about $12 billion of that is actually coming from Indigenous businesses. And you know, all that, that number does sound impressive, and it is in its own right, considering that we've been on the peripheral of mainstream society for a very long time. That still only represents about a percentage and a half of the total GDP, when we represent closer to 5% of the population. So there's a $100 billion economy that is coming. And there is a, a strong trajectory, as you can see here, the growth is outpacing that of the, uh, the average GDP uh, here in Canada. And this number will, continues uh, to grow. Now, I know that everybody on the phone here knows how important research is. Our organization has been around uh, the research developing research, and we actually do have uh, one project with, with Queen's, um, developing uh, a knowledge base from, uh, from over a decade of research, and we do have the best in the country when it comes to the Indigenous economy. And the point that I'm trying to make is that uh, quite often we make decisions, policy decisions or industry makes decisions without really having the best uh, knowledge or data in front of them. Um, so this is sort of a shout out to my research team in that uh, we're here to partner with all sorts of organizations. I, don't, uh, I haven't gotten the chance to look at everybody who is on the call today, but if, if research is important to you and advancing your knowledge base, I, I really highly recommend that uh, you reach out to our team uh, to see what we're capable of. Uh, as an example, we just got out of um, over 100 First Nation communities from coast to coast to coast. Uh, looking at the Indigenous economy, and uh, it's, uh, it's been an outstanding experience for my team and uh, as well as, as myself to be able to uh, take from this data and start to analyze it to break down uh, where the opportunities and challenges are. And I'm going to show you some of the, um, uh, some of the stats that we've been to develop uh, over the years. Um, so you heard me earlier say that there are a lot of corporations that are really getting it. Uh, really starting to begin to uh, beginning to understand that if they invest in the relationships rather than lawyers, that they actually find themselves in a place of strength in partnership with Indigenous communities and businesses. The CCAB has a, a program called PAR, Progressive Aboriginal Relations, that's a third-party certification program that helps corporations uh, uh, in setting them on a, a stronger path when it comes to working with Indigenous businesses and communities in areas of, of procurement, employment, engagement, investment, essentially putting a framework out there to achieve better, to 
really align their, their corporation in, uh, in a way that is actually going to benefit not only their corporation but the communities and businesses that they're working with and, and setting targets and, and really digging deep around um, uh, proj or processes like internally uh, doing cultural sensitivity training, understanding your communities of interest, et cetera. So this program has been around uh, uh, quite a while, and so it really does get into areas of leadership, employment, and I've, and I've, I've, I've overloaded my PowerPoint presentation deliberately, so I'm sorry if I'm going fast through this. I know you'll have access to this because I want you to be able to come back to this, but I do want to hit the, the high points um, here. And I want to get to, to show you um, why this program is so important because Folks on the phone probably are aware of ISO um, in the sense that if you've got an ISO certification that you're a, a well-managed uh, company. Well, it's the same thing with the PAR program and that there's a, uh, the community cases that there's assurance to the communities that they're good partners or good companies to work with and, and that they're ensuring that Indigenous communities and businesses are being heard. And from a CSR framework um, management, a framework for management, sorry, um, it's a validation of their performance and it helps establish a reputation within the Indigenous community. And, and these companies here, these ones are the uh, committed companies. So they're just starting out for the first three years, starting to put in place uh, processes. So you can see they are some of the largest companies uh, in the country um, that are committed to building Indigenous relationships. And they, they, the wonderful thing is that they're a cross sector. Um, and the, uh, these companies are putting significant time, effort, and resources. It's not an expensive program by any means, but it is a program that takes effort, and anything worth doing well does take time and effort, and uh, they are investing uh, that. Um, Timber West is, uh, is special to me. The, these are the uh, bronze level companies. As a forester, um, just spending a lot of time with them, and I was out in, in the, uh, on the island, uh, Vancouver Island this past uh, summer with them, working with their communities. And so they're, they're investing uh, a lot of time ensuring that the Indigenous people are being employed and being trained, and that they've got the Indigenous managers that are at the forefront of this as well, uh, and their investments in time and energy. I just wanted to post one of those out. But uh, Brooke McElroy is an architectural firm um, that is, is, is absolutely committed to ensuring that there's Indigenous space uh, and place in a lot of the uh, a lot of the work that they do, and inspiring Indigenous architects uh, to be a part of the uh, of the program. Um, we move up to the silver le level. Um, you can see again uh, some some large companies here. Um, I want to pause here for a second and talk about Civio. Um, Civio is a company that does a lot of you know, camp services, um, water services, uh, remote services, and uh, they've been doing incredibly great work. And what's happening is that they're actually winning a lot of contracts with Suncor. And this is really important because when we talk about changing the way that we do business, we need not only the validators to talk about the opportunity of change, but we also need the companies that are taking action. So Suncor is a company that when they put out a contract, um, what they do is they, you know, price, quality, safety, everything else being equal, they recognize uh, CCAB's certified Aboriginal businesses, um, as well as some of their uh, strategic community partnerships as priorities. And so those companies are getting a few extra points on the scorecard. So that can often mean the difference between getting work and, and, um, uh, and missing the work. The other thing is that we recognize that a lot of our Indigenous businesses aren't at the scale that can compete against some of the global powerhouses. And so what Suncor said, you know, what we're going to do is um, we're going to look to other companies that hold the PAR designation and we're going to give them extra points on the scorecard, uh, price, quality, safety, everything else being equal. And why wouldn't you? because these companies are putting the same level of effort uh, and time and resources into those relationships that you are. And so what that's doing is, is it's driving behavioral change within, the, within their supply chain. And so companies understand now that if they're going to do business with Suncor, uh, that they've got to start investing time in the relationships as well. I don't, you know, if I, and, I, and I totally understand Suncor's point, like they shouldn't have to be doing this alone. 
And I'm going to get into some of the, the government conversation here in a bit. We work closely with a number of the government agencies, and we're looking for that same type of shift uh, when it comes to bolstering the Indigenous economy. So the, the name of the title of the presentation was Recon uh, Economic Reconciliation Through Procurement, and we're incredibly passionate about this topic. And this is where I want to spend most of my time. So when we've done the work with Indigenous communities, our businesses, one of the things that they've said, and for the most part, it's, it's just absolutely true, is that in order for them to proliferate, I mean, we've got to get access to capital. We've got to get access to the right people to help drive our business up forward. But if you, you, you can have the best good or service in the world, but if you can't get access to a supply chain to get your, your, your business out there, um, you're not going to succeed. And, you know, this is the part where you might get a little, little bit antsy in your seats, but there are some preconceived, oh, there are barriers around preconceived notions who we are, and racism is alive and well in this country. Um, and, and that often um, prohibits Indigenous businesses to getting to the starting line. What was fascinating, though, when we actually did the research with one of our partners around what Canadians thought, um, they actually recognized when they were asked the question about uh, Indigenous businesses, um, I was pleasantly surprised that a lot of Canadians actually saw that business was a way to reconciliation and that Indigenous businesses have much to offer the Canadian economy. And they recognized that uh, the importance of these enterprises to create you know, economic opportunities for the people which, again, contribute to the bottom line of Canada. So that really does align with our uh, Aboriginal businesses when it comes to what they are uh, what they are hoping for, and so a lot of the work that we're doing around the uh, the procurement and the supply chain uh, has been making its way through the private sector. Um, we are starting to make some headway when it comes to the uh, various governments, sorry, federal. Some provinces are starting to get, and actually we're working with some of the larger uh, municipalities like, uh, like Toronto, and we're having conversations with the city of Edmonton, et cetera. So municipalities are starting to understand the value and power of the Indigenous business sector as well. Um, the challenge is that, and going back to that relationship between Suncor and Civio, is that a lot of our, our Indigenous businesses um, that uh, are bidding on contracts aren't able to um, uh, compete at that level. So we've got to find different pathways for these Indigenous businesses. But you can, can you imagine when you're in a community, a small community, and your one, one, you, if you're indig your, your business is a mother or a father, uncle or aunt, uh, are, are earning $100,000 per contract, that's, that's food on the plate for the family, and the contributions that that make to the community are significant. So this segment, although it is, uh, the it is the largest segment of our population that compete in business, um, it's, it's, it's something that we need to really focus on to, to be able to scale up these businesses because there are some of our indigenous businesses that do two, three, four hundred million dollars a year in revenue, uh, and some are approaching that half a billion dollar mark. And, and that's because you've got to start somewhere. So empowering that base is really important, and procurement uh, is a way to do that. And I, you know, I like to have fun with this uh, particular slide. In uh, a couple of years ago, in one year, these three companies uh, spent a billion dollars uh, on indigenous businesses, which is absolutely outstanding. Uh, Suncor, as an example, uh, they spend uh, about a half a billion dollars a year on indigenous businesses, as, as I had mentioned. And interestingly, um, the outcomes of that, and you look at the other companies' contributions, is that the community members of Fort Mackay First Nation are earning $73,570 plus dollars a year on average. I mean, that is, that is absolutely outstanding. When you compare that to the average Canadian of uh, around 39,000 or the average Albertan to put in geographic context of uh, 50,600, you can begin to understand the impact that that has in the community. And a lot of the social indicators have been pointing in the wrong way for our communities for a very long time highest incarceration rates, lowest education rates, highest unemployment rates, highest birth mortality rates, lowest uh, life expectancy rates, all these things are, um, are, are a black mark on this country, quite frankly. But when you look, and then I've been up to the community a few times, and I I've, I've know the community really well, you know, you, look, you drive to that community, and they've got a, a, a community center for their youth that will rival anything in the city of Toronto um, as far as scale. Um, they've got uh, beautiful homes. Uh, anybody that wants a job has a job. 
um, and, and they're just proliferating. So you begin to think about the impact that, that the socioeconomic impact that that has in their community, and it is, it is significant. Sadly, when we look at the federal procurement spend, um, it's nowhere near that. As one of, Can one of Canada's biggest procurers of business, uh, they are spending between 60 and 100 million dollars a year, about 0.3 percent or so. And this is uh, this is definitely something that uh, that has to change. I mean, Suncor, as an example, spends 10 times what the federal government does uh, on Aboriginal business in, in 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 some years. And so, again, it's it's about you know we've got uh, the Trudeau government who has made a strong commitment to the Indigenous community. You know, they're they're trying their best. I mean, I know some of their ministers are doing great work, but they shouldn't be doing it alone. I think simple policy shifts around their procurement policy. Uh, and the way that they procure uh, business by by setting targets um, can have a significant impact in the communities. And again, we, we got to look at the total overall opportunity. When we talk about, yes, it adds income to the communities, but it also means that the more that we invest in the communities, the less that we've got to uh, put into the jail systems or or the social the social. Um, um, nets that uh, we have in place for, for everybody. Um, and, you know, the tax base. Uh, for instance, Fort Mackay First Nation, as an example, uh, they, they write a check to the government every year between seven and nine million dollars a year in taxes. And their agreements, their legal agreements with the government, uh, the programming that they receive, the program dollars, uh, is in the area of two to three million dollars. So they're net contributors to Canada's economy. And again, that's a result of business. Um, so the more that we can empower, the better it is. And, and this is the challenge uh, for an organization like CCAB and some of our sister organizations is trying to get this knowledge to the dinner plates of the average Canadian that we all should be doing something with the because it in, with the Indigenous community because it impacts everybody. It impacts it, it impacts every Canadian, and it's it's something that we should uh, be focusing on. Excuse me. So. Um, procurement champions. And again, you heard me say earlier, it's about validators. It's about champ companies that are championing new ways forward. Uh, so this is Mark Little from, and I've, I've used Suncor a lot, and there are a lot of great companies within the CCAB. Um, I just uh, I happen to be focusing on, on Suncor because Mark is he's the chief operating officer, and he's also my co-chair. And uh, Mark and I have been, uh, since January, we, we, we made the, the challenge to Canadian companies to uh, join us uh, to change the way that supply chain is done in this country. And I hope that I've made a little bit of an argument for you in that um, when, you, when, you, when you begin to build the businesses, the, 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 it's not about uh, small, everybody getting up. It's about growing the pie. It's not, it's not just focusing on your piece. And so these companies uh, absolutely understand that. And so essentially these procurement champions who continue to come on uh, weekly um, are um, changing up the way that they do supply chain, uh, removing those barriers within their organizations by ensuring that there's somebody to help direct, direct um, Indigenous entrepreneurs to their business opportunities. We have a, a platform that just, uh, just went live uh, uh, last month. Uh, with our partner Tealbook, um, which uh, it's like a dating site essentially. We've got a, a lot of great opportunities for businesses, both Indigenous and non. I want to point out that there are a number of Indigenous businesses in here as well um, that are putting their opportunities on the on the platform. It uh, uses artificial intelligence to uh, hone in the opportunities, um, both as the uh, supplier of the opportunity and the uh, and the and the and the businesses that are looking to get in front of them, and uh, so these companies have been stepping up in a big way uh, to uh, to make a difference, and so our Aboriginal businesses are starting to see already some significant impacts, and we're quite proud of this uh, of this new program. Um, <laughs> originally, I had this really wonderful uh, gift that happens here. It's uh, you know, they go supply chains, and then it's this feather falls down, and it's, it's supply change. But really, that is um, purposeful. It's um, 
it's something that um, when we begin to, again, I hope I'm making the argument for you that the way that we do business, when you change up the way that you do the supply chains within your organizations, and every organization needs paper, every organization needs a lot of organizations catering services or janitorial services or we have engineering firms, we've got uh, architectural firms, we've got all sorts of firms that are, are hungry for your business. So stepping outside of your regular way of doing business uh, and stepping up and, and actually procuring and reaching out to some of these indigenous businesses that are in your region um, can have significant impact. So it does offer the opportunity to supply chain change. Um, our organization, again, you know, it's been around for 36 years, but it's really about changing the national conversation in this country. Um, as an Indigenous person, you know, I've been very fortunate in my life. My, my, my grandmothers were both residential school survivors. My grandfathers uh, were French and Scottish. Uh, my parents were incredibly lucky that they had one parent that worked, um, and that modeling uh, stuck with them and it stuck to me. And I was very fortunate uh, to have that modeling. Uh, in many cases, in many communities across our country, uh, that a lot of our communities don't have that type of modeling. So um, we've got to find ways to change that. Um, and it really starts with people on the phone as well. It starts with the organizations that we get to work with. And it also um, it's all, it really is about partnerships and, and sharing the positive stories. Um, quite often, um, after I do a talk in person, um, you know, I have a lot of people come up to me and go, I had no idea. And I said, I'm not surprised. I mean, we've been pretty much ignored for a very long time. And it's something that is an assault on Canadian values in that uh, the Indigenous situation in this country is, is bad, bad, as it, as bad as it is in some regions. Um, but there's also some incredible success stories of Indigenous businesses that are thriving and there are partners with corporations that are thriving. And I, and I want to highlight one right now. Uh, Fort Mackay, just to put that some scale to it. So Fort Mackay First Nation and um, uh, Mikasu Cree Nation just, they went to the market and they raised over half a billion dollars to become an equity partner uh, in, a, in a Suncor East, and it comes that Suncor word again. Uh, they truly are leaders. Um, in an East Tanks uh, farm project, oil project. And, you know, that's a testament to the power of, of, a, of, of a relationship and the trust. Um, and, you know, we're, we're looking at, you know, here in Ontario, we've got, uh, you know, Taku Tagum up in northern Ontario, the Timmins region, who uh, have a 33% uh, equity stake in a major hydro project, or Moose Creek First Nation that have a 25% stake in a hydro project. Renewable energy projects that are popping up all over the country or have been in operation, whether that be transport, uh, uh, generation or, or transmission, and there are so many indigenous partners that are a part of it. Um, I like to focus on the on on those bright spots and share those stories so that Canadians can begin to understand that there is the there is possibility, um, there is opportunity, and that it actually does add to the bottom line of, uh, of corporations that choose uh, to be purposeful in the way that they do business with indigenous businesses and communities. And and you know I I, I challenge everybody on the phone to really take the time um, to uh, learn more, uh, engage. There's so many great Indigenous organizations out there that are uh, doing great work, a lot of great companies that are doing great work. Um, I, I want to leave you with one more thought, and I want to open up to questions because I'm more about conversation. I have a harder time talking to uh, the screens and not seeing your faces. Um, but you know, one of uh, one of the Canadians that I that I admired, and um, I read his uh, book Triple Crown, uh, the late Jim Prentice. If you get a chance to read that book, um, please do. And you know, he was a one of the. I think he was the only minister that took on the Indigenous file purposefully, and he understood that Canada's um, future really did. Uh, parallel the results of the Indigenous community and, and the outcomes there. And what I admired about Jim um, and what I admire about a lot of non-Indigenous leaders is that they take the time to go out and meet communities. Um, when I was a forestry tech, uh, we were doing this, we were grading trees, uh, ones, twos, and threes. Ones being a really fantastic tree, a two being okay, oh, there's some great lumber and there's some pulp, and threes just being pulp. 
And all of us were sitting there uh, yelling out from the road, oh, that's a one, no, it's a two. And we had this debate and the, and the prof said, you're all wrong. None of you took the time to walk around that tree to see what the other side looked like. And, and I think that's the big challenge in this country about how many Canadians take the time to walk around the Aboriginal community to see what it looks like. And you're going to be pleasantly surprised. Not all the time. There are some real challenges in many of our communities, but there are so many bright spots um, that are out there. So I challenge everybody on, on this one, if you haven't already, uh, to take the time to walk around the Indigenous tree to, to, to see what we're about truly. So with that, um, I understand there are some questions coming forward, and I'm going to read this one first. Um, what is the best way to identify an Aboriginal or Indigenous business? That's, that's a great question. Um, the challenge is that um, we have 43,000 is what our research, and we have a database of about 16,000 of them. What we do as an organization is certify them. It's one thing for a non-Indigenous company if they think that they're going to be able to challenge, and, and if, are you Indigenous? Because the Indigenous person, if they are, will basically you know, challenge right back, who are you to tell me if I'm Indigenous or not? Uh, we have a third party, or sorry, a certification program that identifies Aboriginal businesses. And you can go to our website at ccab.com to check out our membership directory. It's searchable by sector, by region. Um, and quite often, businesses will self identify. Uh, interestingly, uh, uh, many for, for a long time wouldn't identify because they knew that would put them at a disadvantage. But lately, um, they are starting to self identify. And if you have any questions about whether they're Indigenous or not, um, you can always say, hey, go check out the CCAB. They'll certify you and put them in a really uh, great uh, growing procurement platform. Um, another question. Why doesn't the government spend more on procurement from uh, Indigenous businesses? And what policy shifts would you like to see? That's a great question. Um, why don't they? I, again, I think it's just a, they just don't know any better. Um, if you're stuck in one sphere and you, you know, you're, you get in your comfort zone, you don't take the time. So we, we are working on an MOU with uh, our friends at INAC, and um, we do have uh, the database, we do have Indigenous businesses, and um, I, I, I spent time on Minister Baines's strategic economic table, and I was on the resources of the future, and, and please can go to, to the government website to see it, but we, uh, we encourage the government to set a target of 5%. Uh, so um, we hope they take that seriously. Um, hopefully that will drive the federal departments. Uh, so really the policy shift there is just setting targets uh, and measuring them and accounting for them. You know, the best example in the world is in Australia where the Aboriginal, if you're going to do any work with the government, you need to show them that you are uh, building business relationships with the Aboriginal people of Australia and show and track your spend with the Aboriginal businesses if you want to get a contract. Uh, I'd love to see that. If you're going to do business with uh, with the government that you show what you're doing to uh, to build the, the the indigenous community. So there's another question coming in over here. What are better ways to engage First Nations during infrastructure improvement projects such as new water treatment plants? Um, that's a, another great question. I, I'm not sure if this is on reserve or off reserve. Um, I'll try to answer both on reserve. It's it's a no brainer if you're going to be building infrastructure in a community. Uh, I would hope that uh, companies are engaging with the communities um, to build the human capital to be able to run these plants, to build the plants. Um, in infrastructure plants, uh, infrastructure in general, um, I'm just going to maybe take a little more of a controversial uh, project like the uh, TMX. Um, back when Kinder Morgan had it, uh, they're really you know, a publicly traded company, they really didn't have uh, a lot of bandwidth to create equity positions and their projects were mostly through impact benefit agreements where they would set aside a certain amount of business contracts and employment contracts and, um, and, and that was great. Now that uh, Canada uh, owns the line, um, what an opportunity to create space for uh, Indigenous uh, communities to buy stake. I mean, it, it, while the interest rates are low right now, uh, the project is um, uh, arguably, I mean, you don't know what your view is on pipelines, but it is. it could be a really incredible project, and I know that a lot of First Nations are in, in favour of the project and want to own a piece of it. Uh, so it's about just opening up. I mean, Canada's got a real unique opportunity right now to open it up for equity positions for First Nations. And if they did that, 
uh, the First Nations um, have become incredibly savvy when it comes to raising financing. Um, and so they'll find the, the money on the street and, um, and be participants. Um, but the engagement, just you know, a piece on the engagement piece, one of the things that if somebody's really new to the Indigenous community, one of the things that I get asked, well, how do you approach it? And quite frankly, um, don't be nervous to go into a community. Uh, we're good people. We've got kids just like you do. Um, I often say, go in without a without an agenda. Just go to meet people. And, you know, we often say the Creator gave us two ears and one mouth for a reason. Listen twice as much as you uh, you speak, and uh, just be humble and and build those relationships. Um, before you build any projects, you've got to build a relationship, and I think that's true in, in business in general. Um, I say one more. So just. Uh, Talking. Oh, keep talking. Okay. Um, from uh, let's see. Um, I'll just I'll just sure read it. To read it to you. Does the CCAB discern between indigenous community-owned businesses, indigenous member-owned, or indigenous joint venture firms agreements by a non-indigenous firm with an FN or Métis community? Yes, yes, we do. So well, we we put uh, every we use the word indigenous or Aboriginal. Aboriginal is constitutionally protected. Indigenous is came more from our grassroots community. We use them interchangeably, but they are an umbrella term for First Nations, Inuit, and Métis, and we recognize all of them. Um, from an Aboriginal business perspective, the company needs to be 51% owned and controlled um, by the, uh, the Indigenous individual uh, or individuals. Um, and um, interestingly, you know, this is um, one of the challenges that uh, is the, the companies face and even communities face and they're called shell companies where uh, say a First Nation person uh, forms a joint venture with a, a larger company um, on paper they say 51 percent um, but the person sometimes is, stays at home to get paid a certain percentage just so they can get access to more contracts. We're very wary of those types of um, joint ventures and we can sniff them out. Um, I'm not necessarily opposed to the starting point of that being a joint venture. If the First Nation is attending board meetings, they're, they've got goals and targets when it comes to, okay, we've got 10 people, Indigenous people that are employed in our company. What's our target for the next one? Um, what am I doing to pay back the equity in this business so that I'm actually an equity participant in this project? What, is, what, is, what, are, what are the targets? Because a lot of communities got their start that way. Um, we didn't have the business acumen. We built relationships and joint ventures with large companies that eventually worked themselves out of business or continued to take a subordinate um, position in the company at 49% with the First Nations actually owning and operating and being the true decision makers. So there is a, a range of Indigenous businesses and frameworks that are out there. Uh, it's just uh, being cognizant of, of what's really driving value to the community by the way of employment and revenue. We've got time for one last one. One more. Uh, any subsidiary, uh, subsidiary of doing business with, in, I'm, I'm not sure, uh, any subsidiary of doing business with Indigenous community? Yeah. Um, I'm going to take that question as a, uh, a subsidiary benefits uh, that accrue doing business with the Indigenous community. Um, well, one, uh, communities are becoming incredibly powerful. If you read in the Globe and Mail a couple of days ago, the LNG project that we came at, I mean, they're, they're driving a lot of the agenda. Um, and having those relationships, uh, real relationships, actually does create a space, space for you. Um, and the cultural benefits as well. I don't spend enough time talking about the just the cultural richness of the richness of the indigenous community. It's it's amazing uh, how diverse it is, how beautiful the people are, how wonderful the food is, um, um, and the uh, the opportunity when you actually begin. And I and I and I have a lot of non-indigenous business friends that work with our communities. I don't think they would have it any other way. They spend enough time in community and they see the opportunity they see the impact that the business has uh, to wrap it up here in 30 seconds or so the impact that business has uh, in a community um, and on its people it it can be transformative and um, what a wonderful thing to be a part of 
So I'll leave it. That's a great place to end. JP Godu, thank you so much for your insights today. Um, for anybody listening, you will be receiving a link to a recording of this of this webinar in two to three business days. Um, we hope that you'll tune in for the next webinar from the Smith School of Business. Thanks for listening.